and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to June 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games, we look back at a dark period in emulation history as its 10th anniversary passes, we play some older games, and check out some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine, in June 1984. DKtronics has released an updated version of its popular keyboard replacement to make it more compatible with the Sinclair's Interface 1 and Microdrive system. The unit will remain at the normal price of £45. Quicksilver, the software company that has been around since 1981, has been sold to Argus Press Software for an undisclosed sum, although it is rumoured to be of several millions. Co-founders Nick Lambert and John Hollis have left the company, but Rod Cousins will remain as managing director. The move also includes Software Studios, a subsidiary of Quicksilver, and also their American company Quicksilver Incorporated. Nearly the complete back catalogue of Imagine games have been sold to Bo Jolly. Imagine will continue to get royalties from some of the games, and Bo Jolly has announced it will be selling older games at a budget price. Games not included in the deal are Cosmic Cruiser, BC Bill and Arcadia, and Imagine will continue to sell these as normal. Two software houses have been given a license to produce computer games based on current television shows. Bugbyte will be writing Automan, a Tron-like program where the hero can walk through walls and become invisible. And a new software company, at the time of this news item unnamed, but we now later know it was called Elite Systems, which was set up by Steve and Richard Wilcox, formerly of Richard Wilcox Software, will get The Fall Guy, a series about a Hollywood stuntman who solves crime. Carmel Software, the producers of games like Volcanic Dungeon and The Black Crystal, have gone into receivership. Sales of its new game, The Wrath of Magra, were not as high as anticipated, causing problems for the three-year-old company. A new fast access storage system has been announced that will compete directly with the mic drive. The wafer drive will be distributed by Rotronics and will contain two drives as standard, each holding up to 128k on a continuous tape loop cartridge. The first units are expected to go on sale in August. And now onto the top selling games. There's been an avalanche of new releases this month, with games like Fighter Pilot from Digital Integration, a game that does what the title suggests. Bullseye from Mastertronic, renamed later to Spectrum Darts, that seems to have no connection with the TV series. Wheelie from Microsphere, a neat motorbike arcade game that proves very addictive and uses a different graphic styling to the average game. Zagson from Starzone Software, finally the Spectrum gets a Zagson clone, although not as playable as the arcade. Trashman from New Generation is an arcade bin collection fest. Cytron from Beyond, a real-time strategy management action game with great graphics. Jack and the Beanstalk from Thor, an average platformer with huge colourful graphics. Zigzag. 3D maze game from DKtronics. And finally Scrabble from Scion, an incredible achievement managing to squeeze the whole game and the rules of the board game into a humble 48k spectrum. And that was the news and games for June 1984. It was about 10 years ago when the emulator scene on the internet was in grave danger of being obliterated without trace. The wealth of information, free emulators and legal games we now have could have all been destroyed or forced underground by an organisation hell-bent on blindly closing down sites without even considering their content. It was a pretty worrying time and I know many site administrators were being put under pressure to ensure their content was legal. So bad was this phase in retro history that many great sites were lost. The threat was not from hackers, but an organisation claiming to represent the games industry. Now calling itself the Entertainment Software Association, it originally went by the name of Interactive Digital Software Association, or better known as the IDSA. 
the IDSA was one of those organisations that tried to make itself look good by boasting about its actions on its website. It claimed to have taken down over 35,000 illegal software sites since its inception, and named amongst its clients are such industry giants as Activision, Capcom, Sony, Sega and Microsoft. Its news pages were filled with proud claims of site closures using US copyright laws, stopping the distribution of pirated software. All well and good, you might think, but there was a nasty side to this organisation that was about to threaten the emulator scene. Everyone makes mistakes, after all, we're all human. But what appeared to be going on seemed, at least to my investigations, along with a few others, was that there was a non-human element to this, and one that the IDSA were reluctant to admit or even back down from. ISPs began to receive takedown notices in 2003, with claims that the sites they were hosting were in breach of copyright or contained illegal software. Notice here that the IDSA did not contact the site owner, they went direct to the ISP. The result of this was that several sites just simply vanished, as ISPs panicked and buckled under the threats of legal action. The IDSA were rampaging through the internet, leaving behind them a group of hard-working administrators with totally legal sites wondering where all their content had suddenly gone. Back to the Roots, a site hosting legal Amiga games and demos, were hit several times and only just managed to survive. The ISP received a takedown notice but passed it on to the admins, who quite rightly requested further information from the IDSA. After all, all of their content was legal. They never got a single reply. As more ISPs received more takedown notices, it was quite clear that the IDSA were using some kind of bot that inspected the contents of websites and reported back any site that seemed to have illegal content. The problem was, it was not human, and it couldn't distinguish a name of a legal file from the name of an illegal file. Take for example Pac-Man. The official arcade ROM is illegal to distribute, but how many Pac-Man clones were there for the Spectrum, or other computers? And what about if someone had written their own basic game called Frogger and uploaded it to World of Spectrum? The IDSA bot was not intelligent enough to identify this, but instead of doing further human investigation, the IDSA just sent out closure notices. Martin van der Heide, the owner of World of Spectrum, also got hit with takedown notices via his ISP. The email claimed that the site hosted an illegal game called Soldier of Fortune, a game that was copyrighted by one of IDSA's clients. Now, Soldier of Fortune was a game released by Activision in 2000, but it was also a game released by Firebird Software in 1988, and guess which one the World of Spectrum had? The IDSA could not even be bothered to check. They assumed they were correct. They ignored emails proving the game was legal. They ignored emails pointing out the permissions section of WAS that included that very game. Looking on their very badly designed website, the things they suggest ISPs look out for when trying to identify pirate sites are a joke. Just look at some of these. A site that often provides games. The page is frequently updated to provide latest titles. Marked increase in traffic. Large sites that have their own domain name. Site owners may be located overseas. Sites provide free downloads. I mean, any intelligent human being knows that any of these can be applied to thousands of legal sites, but sadly the IDSA were given this false information to ISPs in a bid to scare them. And it worked. Many site owners were angry, especially as the IDSA absolutely refused to make contact with anybody. There was a growing backlash on the internet, with people like myself and Martin making plans to go public and show what the IDSA were really doing to innocent site owners, without even having the decency to contact them. I contacted a popular magazine at the time, and had written an open letter to the IDSA asking them to clarify some very important things, amongst them what technologies were they using to determine if a file was illegal, and if the file was suspected of being illegal, did they then go further and check the site manually? Did they search for the site for any permissions that may have been given to the site to distribute that game? Why did they not contact the site owner and give them a chance to defend themselves? And why have they never replied to any emails that sent to them? I didn't expect a reply, but I got one. A very, very short one that just simply said what was the deadline for the magazine article. I replied informing them that it was two weeks, and I received no further contact. I think, or at least hope, the growing anger around the emulator scene and the numerous emails sent and the hundreds of false positives they were getting caused them to rethink their plan and pull the bot out of circulation, at least until they could fix the horrible coding and logic it had. I'm not claiming to have made a difference here, 
Whatever the reason, just as several people were about to blow the whistle publicly, they changed their name and backed off. Let's just hope it stays that way. This is Head Coach from Addictive Games, released in 1986. American football has quite a strong following in the UK, but unless you have Sky TV, the coverage is a bit pathetic. If you are or were a fan, then you probably bought at least one Spectrum game connected with the sport. The one you chose will be governed by the type of game that you like, action or strategy. This is a strategy game, very similar to Football Manager from the same company. After loading, you are taken through the initial process of choosing a team and skill levels and you have the usual management options. The game comes with a lengthy instruction sheet, and even being a fan of the game I had to read it to understand the on-screen abbreviations. From the main screen you have several options, including looking at the transfer situation. Here you can see if players are available to trade, useful if you've got a poor set of players to start with. You do get a chance to trade before each game as well, as each team may offer you a trade for one of their players. Before each game, you get to select which players you want to participate. When you are shown a list of your players, there are several things you look out for. R is how strong they are at running, P is how strong they are at passing, and L is how strong they are at line plunge. AG is the age of the player, FT is their fitness, and FM is their current form. All of these figures add up to a total score that will affect the game and how each player functions. These values change as each game progresses, and some players may become injured, so you have to keep an eye on these. Once you've made the changes and chosen your squad, it's time to get on with your first game. Before the game starts, you're given statistics about the opposing team. And here you can see the differences between your team and theirs. So for example, if their team's particularly poor at run defence, it would be a good idea to use a lot of running plays. And finally we get the game itself. At the top of the screen you get the two teams that are playing, along with a representation of the pitch. Also at the top of the screen is the time bar, this shows how much time there is left in the game. The bottom part of the screen indicates what's particularly going on, which down you're on, how many yards you have to go, and your choices for offence or defence. Now in the real game there's a kickoff, but not here, the attacking team seems to start randomly from various positions, sometimes right back at the five yard line. This takes away the option of runbacks, which is a bit disappointing really. If you're the attacking team you're given a choice of which place to run, you don't get a full list or even specific plays, you just get an option to either run, pass, kick or line plunge. Each of the plays, if successful, will gain various yards. A pass, for example, will gain a minimum of 10 yards, whereas a run can get you nothing. The defending team will then reveal how they plan to defend the play. This seems to be sort of semi-random. Then the play runs and you see your players moving around in character squares, carrying out what you've asked them to do. The whole process, I think, after playing quite a few games, is decided by random waiting. So if you choose a passing play, for example, and the defending team choose to defend against the pass, your chances of completing the play are reduced. Even choosing novice mode at the start, I got whitewashed every single game. This felt a bit demoralising, really. It seems that every one of your plays ended in failure or an interception, and then the first player that the other team took ended up in a score. And this happened time after time after time. In the real game, team has four attempts to move the ball 10 yards. These are called downs. On the fourth down, if you can't manage it, you get to kick the ball to the other team, and they start their attack from wherever the ball is. This game, though, only gives you two downs per play, and it claims it does this to improve gameplay. But it proves very limiting, and often caused me to lose possession, due to the fact that I kept thinking I had four. The play outcome is displayed at the bottom of the screen, with colourful notices for touchdowns and scoring. Get used to seeing these for the other team though. After playing for a full season, that's 12 games, I hadn't won a single game, and only managed to score a few times. The close season allowed me to pick some newer players from the draft, and allowed all of my players to rest. The second season started much the same as the first, with my team losing every single game. It doesn't really encourage you to continue, but I continued anyway in the hope that I might actually win a game. Luckily, I did. 
I played this game for over four hours through two full seasons, winning only two games. It was an improvement on the previous season, but it gave me no real incentive to carry on. I know this is a spectrum, but this game could have been so much better. A small choice of plays would have been nice, so instead of just offering a running play for example, you'd get to choose run left, run right, or a quarterback sneak. The same could be said for passing. The defensive plays could also include more options, and I think this would have opened up the game much more and made it a lot better. Another neat option would allow you to rename the players so you can play as your favourite team. And I also think you should be given the choice of how long you want the game to be played, because as it stands it's really too short. As a fan of American football this game is not really recommended. It feels too limited, and because it's written in basic it can often be slow and cumbersome. It's so annoying not to complete a pass time after time and then see the other team score with their first play. So I think really this is one for fans only, if only just to see how it compares with the other games. Cyclone, released in 1985, was the second game by Vortex to use the engine developed by its founder and programmer, Costa Pagnai, and I hope that's how you pronounce it. The engine was originally used in the fast-paced TLL, or Tornado Low Level, but in Cyclone it's brought into a much slower and more strategic game, and some say for the better. I certainly like Cyclone better than its predecessor. The object of the game is to pilot a helicopter around an area collecting crates and, for bonuses, rescuing people. The area is quite large and consists of many small islands, each randomly holding a crate. The map view shows your location along with the location of the cyclone, and this must be avoided at all costs, so you'll be using the map view quite a lot. As you fly closer to the cyclone, your helicopter begins to shake and the controls become more difficult. Get too close and you crash. Your helicopter also needs fuel, and some islands have helipads that can be used for this purpose. The graphics are really good and stand out as being something different from other Spectrum games. They offer a colourful view of the islands with trees and houses that can be switched to see behind the 3D hills in case there's a crate there. You can crash into the landscape if you're not high enough, and your altitude is shown on the control panel. You can also crash into other aircraft, so you have to be careful. Controls are fairly simple to use and learn, and are very responsive. You can increase and decrease your altitude, rotate the helicopter, and move forward. When you find a crate or decide you want to rescue a person, you just centre the helicopter above them and drop down to the correct altitude. Once there, a hook will be deployed and you pick them up automatically. There are five crates to collect, but it's no easy task, as you have to continually keep away from the cyclone and keep an eye on your fuel. Knowing where the nearest island is that has a helipad is essential if you want to complete your mission. The screen layout is easy to read, providing all the information and giving you warnings of impending doom. I really enjoyed this game, it's quite engrossing, and at the same time it, it can be quite exciting, especially if you've got one crate left to collect and there's a cyclone heading straight for you. It's hard to describe what type of game this is, it's not a fast paced arcade game, it's not a slow strategy game, it's something in the middle, and for me this really makes it attractive. I'd certainly give this one a try. This is Toofy in Fanland a game created by Jonathan Caldwell's arcade game designer, and written by myself. The premise of the game is quite simple. You have to control the main character, Toofy, as he goes around collecting nuts from various screens. This is no ordinary platform game though, and there are a lot of elements to consider. You can move Toofy left and right and up and down, but only if he's on a particular wall. It's quite difficult to explain unless you actually see the game. There are fans embedded in various places, and touching these will propel Toofy to the opposing wall. 
This means that at any time Toofy could be upside down or stuck to the left hand wall or the right hand wall, allowing him to get past the screen and avoid the nasties. I suppose you could call this a sort of strategic platform game. It's not fast paced, but you do need to work out the best route to avoid the nasties and make best use of the fans. The graphics and sound are good, and the gameplay is quite engrossing. It's more of a brain challenge than anything else, and it'll certainly pass half an hour. I know this is my game and it's a shameful plug, but why not? That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.